anti-Polish sentiment. Polonophobia, anti-Polonism, and anti-Polish sentiment are terms for a variety of hostile attitudes, prejudice, and actions against Polish persons and culture. These include racial prejudice against Poles and persons of Polish descent, ethnically based discrimination, and state-sponsored mistreatment of Poles and Polish diaspora. This prejudice led to mass killings and genocide or to justify atrocities during and after World War II, notably by the German Nazis, Ukrainian nationalists and Soviet communists. Anti-Polish sentiment includes defamation and derogatory stereotyping of Poles as unintelligent and aggressive, as thugs, thieves, alcoholics, and as anti-Semites. It includes rising workplace discrimination and criminal violence against Poles. Forms of hostility toward Poles and Polish culture include A historic example of anti-Polish sentiment was Polakosis II, a Polish term introduced in the 19th century in relation to the dismemberment and annexation of Poland by foreign powers. Polakosis II described the forcible suppression of Polish culture, education and religion on historically Polish lands, and the elimination of Poles from public life as well as from landed property. Anti-Polish policies were implemented by the German Empire under Otto von Bismarck, especially during the Kulturkampf, and enforced up to the end of World War I. Organized persecution of Poles raged in the territories annexed by the Russian Empire, mainly under Tsar Nicholas II. Historic actions inspired by anti-Polonism ranged from felonious acts motivated by hatred, to physical extermination of the Polish nation, the goal of which was to eradicate the Polish state. During World War II, when most of Polish society became the object of genocidal policies of its neighbors, German anti-Polonism led to an unprecedented campaign of mass murder. At present, among those who often express their hostile attitude towards the Polish people are some Russian politicians and their far-right political parties who search for a new imperial identity. In Russian language, the term Mazurk, a synonym for pickpocket, petty thief, literally means little Masovian. The word is an example of Vladimir Putin's liberal use of colloquialisms has been catching attention of the media. The Polish plumber cliché may symbolize the threat of cheap labor from poorer European countries to overtake jobs in wealthier parts of Europe. On the other hand, others associated with affordability and dependability of European migrant workers. Drunkenness is associated with Polish people in several European cultures, the French language is the phrase drunk as a Pole, while German uses the phrase drunk as a Pole on payday. The book, by Agansky, The Brute Polak Stereotype in Polish-Jewish Relations and American Popular Culture, by Danusia Vygoska, analyzes stereotypes, in American popular culture, of Poles as brutish and anti-Semitic. Anti-Polish rhetoric combined with the condemnation of Polish culture was most prominent in the 18th century Prussia during the partitions of Poland. Dot, however, anti-Polish propaganda begins with the Teutonic Order in the 14th century. It was a very important tool in the order's attempt to conquer the Duchy of Lithuania which eventually failed because of Lithuania's personal union with the crown of the Kingdom of Poland and conversion to Catholicism. Germany becoming more and more permeated with Teutonic Prussianism, has never since abandoned these tactics. For instance, David Blackburn of Harvard University speaks of the scandalized writings of German intellectual Johann Georg Forster, who was granted a tenure at Vilnius University by the Polish Commission of National Education in 1784. Forster wrote of Poland's backwardness in a similar vein to ignorance and barbarism of Southeast Asia. Such views were later repeated in the German ideas of Lebensraum and exploited by the Nazis. German academics between the 18th and 20th centuries attempted to project, in the difference between Germany and Poland, a boundary between civilization and barbarism, high German culture and primitive Slavdom. Prussian officials, eager to secure Polish partition, encouraged the view that the Poles were culturally inferior and in need of Prussian tutelage. Such racist texts, originally published from the 18th century onwards, were republished by the German Reich prior to and after its invasion of Poland. Frederick the Great of Prussia nourished a particular hatred and contempt for the Polish people. Following his conquest of Poland, he compared the Poles to Iroquois of Canada. In his all-encompassing anti-Polish campaign, even the nobility of Polish background living in Prussia were obliged to pay higher taxes than those of German heritage. 
Polish monasteries were viewed as layers of idleness and their property often seized by Prussian authorities. The prevalent Catholicism M among Poles was stigmatized. The Polish language was persecuted at all levels. When Poland lost the last vestiges of its independence in 1795 and remained partitioned for 123 years, ethnic Poles were subjected to discrimination in two areas, the Germanization under Prussian and later German rule, and Russification in the territories annexed by Imperial Russia. Being a Pole under the Russian occupation was in itself almost culpable, wrote Russian historian Ludmila Gatagova. Practically all of the Russian government, bureaucracy, and society were united in one outburst against the Poles. Rumor mongers informed the population about an order that had supposedly been given to kill and take away their land. Polish culture and religion were seen as threats to Russian imperial ambitions. Tsarist named Nick suppressed them on Polish lands by force. The Russian anti-Polish campaign, which included confiscation of Polish nobles' property, was waged in the areas of education, religion as well as language. Polish schools and universities were closed in a stepped-up campaign of Russification. In addition to executions and mass deportations of Poles to Kartiga camps, Tsar Nicholas I established an occupation army at Poland's expense. The fact that Poles, unlike the Russians, were overwhelmingly Roman Catholic gave impetus to their religious persecution. At the same time, with the emergence of pan-slavist ideology, Russian writers accused the Polish nation of betraying their Slavic family because of their armed efforts aimed at winning independence. Hostility toward Poles was present in many of Russia's literary works and media of the time. During and after the 1830-1831 insurrection many Russian writers voluntarily participated in anti-Polish propaganda. Gogol wrote Taras Bulba, an anti-Polish novel of high literary merit, to say nothing about lesser writers. Professor Vil Hahal Pushkin, together with three other poets, published a pamphlet called On the Taking of Warsaw to celebrate the crushing of the revolt. His contribution to the frenzy of anti-Polish writing comprised poems in which he hailed the capitulation of Warsaw as a new triumph of Imperial Russia. In Prussia and later in Germany, Poles were forbidden to build homes, and their properties were targeted for forced buyouts financed by the Prussian and subsequent German governments. Bismarck described Poles as animals that one shoots if one can and implemented several harsh laws aimed at their expulsion from traditionally Polish lands. The Polish language was banned from public use, and ethnically Polish children punished at school for speaking Polish. Poles were subjected to a wave of forceful evictions. The German government financed and encouraged settlement of ethnic Germans into those areas aiming at their geopolitical Germanization. The Prussian land tag passed laws against Catholics. Toward the end of World War I during Poland's fight for independence, Imperial Germany made further attempts to take control over the territories of Congress Poland, aiming at ethnic cleansing of up to three million Jewish and Polish people which was meant to be followed by a new wave of settlement by ethnic Germans. In August 1914 the German Imperial Army destroyed the city of Kalisz, chasing out tens of thousands of its Polish citizens. After Poland regained its independence as the Second Republic at the end of World War I, the question of new Polish borders could not have been easily settled against the will of her former long-term occupiers. Poles continue to be persecuted in the disputed territories, especially in Silesia. The German campaign of discrimination contributed to the Silesian uprisings, where Polish workers were openly threatened with losing their jobs and pensions if they voted for Poland in the Upper Silesia plebiscite. At the Versailles Peace Conference of 1919, British historian and politician Louis Bernstein Namier, who served as part of the British delegation, was seen as one of the biggest enemies of the newly independent Polish state in the British political environment and in the Polish territories. He falsified the earlier proposed Curzon Line by detaching the city of Lwów from Poland with a version called Curzon Line. It was sent to Soviet diplomatic representatives for acceptance. The earlier compromised version of Kurz Online which was debated at the SPA conference of 1920 was renamed Kurz Online B. After 1926 Lithuanian coup d'etat, anti-Polish government came to power. Lithuanization of Poles and spread of anti-Polish propaganda was usual. In March 1938, border clash on Polish-Lithuanian border in which Polish Border Protection Corps officer was killed. 
After this, Marshal Edward Smigley writes send ultimatum to Lithuanian government which demanded immediate diplomatic relations between both countries. In the politics of interwar Germany, anti-Polish feelings ran high. The American historian Gerhard Weinberg observed that for many Germans in the Weimar Republic, Poland was an abomination, Poles were an East European species of cockroach, Poland was usually described as a Sazen star, and Germans used the phrase Polish economy for a situation of hopeless muddle. Weinberg noted that in the 1920s 30s, leading German politicians refused to accept Poland as a legitimate nation, and hoped instead to partition Poland, probably with the help of the Soviet Union. The British historian A.J.P. Taylor wrote in 1945 that National Socialism was inevitable because the Germans wanted to repudiate the equality with the peoples of Eastern Europe which had then been forced upon them after 1918. Taylor wrote that. During the preceding 80 years the Germans had sacrificed to the Reich all their liberties, they demanded as a reward the enslavement of others. No German recognized the Czechs or Poles as equals. Therefore, every German desired the achievement which only total war could give. By no other means could the Reich be held together. It had been made by conquest and for conquest, if it ever gave up its career of conquest, it would dissolve. During Stalin's great terror in the Soviet Union, the largest ethnic shooting and deportation operation, known as the Polish Genocide in the Soviet Union, took place from about the 25th of August 1937 through the 15th of November 1938. According to Soviet NKVD archives, 111,091 Poles, and people accused of ties with Poland, were executed, and 28,744 were sentenced to death-ridden labor camps, for a total of 139,835 Polish victims. This number constitutes 10% of the officially persecuted persons during the entire Yezhovshina period, with confirming NKVD documents. The coordinated actions of the Soviet NKVD and the Communist Party in 1937-1938 against the Polish minority living in the Soviet Union, representing only 0.4% of Soviet citizens, amounted to an ethnic genocide as defined by the UN Convention, concluded historian Michael Elman. His opinion is shared by Simon C. Bag Montefiore, Professor Marek Janchodakiewicz, Dr. Thomas Sommer, and others. In typical Stalinist fashion, the murdered Polish families were accused of anti-Soviet activities and state terrorism. Hostilities toward Polish people reached a particular peak during World War II, when Poles became the subject of ethnic cleansing on an unprecedented scale, including, Nazi German genocide in general government, Soviet executions and mass deportations to Siberia from Krasy, as well as massacres of Poles in Volhynia, a campaign of ethnic cleansing carried out in today's western Ukraine by Ukrainian nationalists. Millions of citizens of Poland, both ethnic Poles and Jews, died in German concentration camps such as Auschwitz. Unknown numbers perished in Soviet gulags and political prisons. Reprisals against partisan activities were brutal, on one occasion 1,200 Poles were murdered in retaliation for the death of one German officer and two German officials. Soviet policy following the 1939 invasion of Poland in World War II was ruthless, and sometimes coordinated with the Nazis. Elements of ethnic cleansing included Soviet mass executions of Polish prisoners of war in the Katyn massacre and at other sites, and the exile of up to 1.5 million Polish citizens, including the intelligentsia, academics and priests, to forced labor camps in Siberia. In German and Soviet war propaganda, Poles were mocked as inept for their military techniques in fighting the war. Nazi fake newsreels and forged pseudo-documentaries claimed that the Polish cavalry bravely but futilely charged German tanks in 1939, and that the Polish air force was wiped out on the ground on the opening day of the war. Neither tale was true. German propaganda staged a Polish cavalry charge in their 1941 reel called Czesław de Lutze. Inexperienced Royal Air Force commanders initially stereotyped veteran Polish fighter pilots as inept and reckless refusing to let them fly combat missions until they chose to do so against orders, they went on to achieve a celebrated record in the Battle of Britain. British military commanders Bernard Montgomery and Frederick Browning scapegoated Polish troops and command for their defeat at the Battle of Arnhem, stereotyping them as difficult and incompetent. 
Later military commentators have generally concurred that the Poles had a distinguished role in the battle and that their commander's ideas could have won it for the Allies. While the allegations of Montgomery and Browning were hypocritical, self-serving and even political, given the great power politics of the day. Poland's relationship with the USSR during World War II was complicated. The main Western powers, the US and UK, understood the importance of the USSR in defeating Germany, to the point of allowing Soviet propaganda to vilify their Polish ally. During World War II, E. H. Carr, the assistant editor of the Times, was well known for his leaders taking the Soviet side in Polish-Soviet disputes. In a leader of 10 February 1945, Carr questioned whether the Polish government in exile even had the right to speak on behalf of Poland. Carr wrote that it was extremely doubtful to him whether the Polish government had an exclusive title to speak for the people of Poland, and a liberum veto on any move towards a settlement of Polish affairs as well as that the legal credentials of this government are certainly not beyond challenge if it were relevant to examine them, the obscure and tenuous thread of continuity leads back at best to a constitution deriving from a quasi-fascist coup d'etat. Carr ended his leader with the claim that what Marshal Stalin desires to see in Warsaw is not a puppet government acting under Russian orders, but a friendly government which fully conscious of the supreme importance of Russo-Polish concord, will frame its independent policies in that context. The Western allies were even willing to help cover up the Soviet massacre at Kutin. With the conclusion of the Second World War, Nazi atrocities perforce ended. However, Soviet oppression of the Poles continued. Under Joseph Stalin, thousands of soldiers of Poland's underground EG Home Army and returning veterans of the Polish armed forces that had served with the Western Allies were imprisoned, tortured by Soviet and KVD agents and murdered following stage trials like the infamous trial of the 16 in Moscow, Russia. A similar fate awaited the cursed soldiers. At least 40,000 members of Poland's Home Army were deported to Russia. In Britain after 1945, the British people initially accepted those Polish servicemen who chose not to return to a Poland ruled by the communist regime. The Poles resident in Britain served under British command during the Battle of Britain, but as soon as the Soviets began to make gains on the Eastern Front both public opinion and the government of the UK turned pro-Soviet and anti-Polish. Supporters of the socialists falsely and deliberately made the Poles out to be warmongers, anti-Semites and fascists. After the war, the trade unions and Labour Party played on the fears of there not being enough jobs, food and housing. There were also anti-Polish rallies. In 1961, a book was published in Germany entitled Der Erzwanschen Krieg by the American historical writer and Holocaust denier David Hogan, which argued that Germany did not commit aggression against Poland in 1939, but was instead the victim of an Anglo-Polish conspiracy against the Reich. Reviewers have often noted that Hogan seemed to have an obsessive hostility towards the Poles. His claims included that the Polish government treated Poland's German minority far worse than the German government under Adolf Hitler treated its Jewish minority. In 1964, much controversy was created when two German right-wing extremist groups awarded Hogan prizes. In the 1980s, the German philosopher and historian Ernst Nolte claimed that in 1939 Poland was engaged in a campaign of genocide against its ethnic German minority, and as strongly implied that the German invasion in 1939, and all of the subsequent German atrocities in Poland during World War II were in essence justified acts of retaliation. Dot critics such as the British historian Richard J. Evans, have accused Nolte of distorting the facts, and have argued that in no way was Poland committing genocide against its German minority. During the political transformation of the Soviet-controlled Eastern Bloc in the 1980s, the traditional German anti-Polish feeling was again openly exploited in the East Germany against Solidarność. This tactic had become especially apparent in the rejuvenation of Polish jokes, some of which reminded listeners of the spread of such jokes under the Nazis. The expressions offensive to Poles are attributed to a number of non-Polish media in relation to World War II. The most prominent is a continued reference by Western news media to Polish death camps and Polish concentration camps. These phrases refer to the network of concentration camps operated by Nazi Germany in occupied Poland in order to facilitate the final solution, but the wording suggests that the Polish people might have been involved. 
the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as Polish organizations around the world and all Polish governments since 1989, condemned the usage of such expressions, arguing that they suggest Polish responsibility for the camps. The American Jewish Committee stated in its 30 January 2005, press release, this is not a mere semantic matter. Historical integrity and accuracy hang in the balance. Any misrepresentation of Poland's role in the Second World War, whether intentional or accidental, would be most regrettable and therefore should not be left unchallenged. On 30 April 2004, a CTV news report made reference to the Polish camp in Treblinka. The Polish embassy in Canada lodged a complaint with CTV. Robert Hurst of CTV, however, argued that the expression, Polish death camp, is common usage in news organizations including those in the United States, and declined to issue a correction. The Polish ambassador to Ottawa then complained to the National Specialty Services Panel of the Canadian Broadcast Standards Council. The Council did not accept Hearst's arguments and ruled against CTV stating that the word Polish similarly to such adjectives as English, French and German had connotations that clearly extended beyond geographic context. Its use with reference to Nazi extermination camps was misleading and improper. CTV broadcast the decision during prime time. The Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs has stated, that example of a successful campaign against the distortion of historic truth by the media, and in defense of the good name of Poland, will hopefully reduce the number of similar incidents in the future. A similar example was the phrase Polish Nazis used in relation to non-Polish paramilitary groups operating on German-occupied Polish soil during World War II, disseminated by Norwegian State Broadcasting Corporation NRK. The Yad Vashem Institute in Jerusalem officially considered this claim by NRK a falsification offensive to historical truth. Since the EU enlargement in 2004, where 10 new countries joined in the single largest expansion to date. The UK has experienced mass immigration from Poland. It is estimated that the Polish-British community has doubled in size since 2004, with Poland now having overtaken India as the largest foreign-born country of origin in 2015. There have been some instances of anti-Polish sentiment and hostility towards Polish immigrants. The far-right British National Party argued for immigration from Eastern Europe to be stopped and for Poles to be deported. In 2007, Polish people living in London reported 42 ethnically motivated attacks against them, compared with 28 in 2004. The Conservative MP Daniel Korzynski, of Polish origin himself, said that the increase in violence towards Poles is in part a result of the media coverage by the BBC whose reporters won't dare refer to controversial immigration from other countries. Korzynski voiced his criticism of the BBC in the House of Commons for using the Polish community as a cat's paw to try to tackle the thorny issue of mass, and checked immigration only because against Poles it's politically correct to do so. In 2009, the Federation of Poles in Great Britain and the Polish Embassy in London with Barbara Tugay Arasinska raised a number of formal complaints, including with the Press Complaints Commission, about news articles that defamed Poles. The PCC arranged a deal between the Federation and the Daily Mail, which ran the articles. The Embassy also questioned the veracity of the Guardian report by Kate Connolly about an alleged storm of protest in Poland in response to a film about a Jewish underground resistance movement. The Polish embassy stated on the 11th of March 2009, disproving the claim, this embassy has been in touch with only distributor in Poland, Monolith Plus, and we have been told that this film has not experienced any form of booing, let alone been banned by any cinemas. The Guardian was also forced by PCC to publish an admission that another article by Simon Jenkins, from 1 September, which accused Poles of wartime suicide, repeated a myth fostered by Nazi propagandists when it said that Polish lancers turned their horses to face Hitler's panzers. There is no evidence that this occurred. The Guardian has been noted for a number of other controversies. On 14 October 2009, Nazi hunter Ephraim Zuroff alleged that, the Second World War narrative has been distorted since independence and the transition to democracy to make it more palatable to their electorate and to minimize the role of local collaborators in Holocaust crimes. On 20 October 2009, The Guardian's Jonathan Friedland said, We are meant to be friendly towards the newest members of the European Union. 
but the truth is that several of these emerging democracies have reverted to a brand of ultra-nationalistic politics that would repel most voters in Western Europe. It exists in Poland. In response to the above attacks Timothy Gartanas wrote in the same paper on the 23rd of December, in my experience, the automatic equation of Poland with Catholicism, nationalism and anti-Semitism, and then so slight a guilt by association with the Holocaust, is still widespread. This collective stereotyping does no justice to the historical record. Dot writing in The Guardian, then UK Foreign Secretary David Miliband, who is of Polish descent himself, described Poland's governing law and justice party as far-right. His language sparked a protest by Daniel Hannan of the Daily Telegraph who said on the 29th of October 2009, that the British Foreign Secretary David Miliband should apologize to the people of Poland. Hannan wrote that Miliband's increasingly unhinged allegations have been greeted with horror in Poland. However, more diatribes reminiscent of wartime propaganda included also the Daily Telegraph's own article by Julian Kosov who wrote on the 13th of November 2009, about the alleged anti-Semitism embedded in Polish history, an episode of Polish bloodlust and nightmarish slaughter and the unspeakable guilt of the Polish collaborators. The Daily Telegraph's Gerald Warner complained about Kosov's insulting attack on Catholics and Poles which grotesquely misrepresents historical fact and which, if leveled at almost any other targets, would probably be characterized as a hate crime. There is, however, an over one millennium long record of positive relations between Poles and Jews. In addition to that, the largest contingent of righteous among the nations who saved the Jews during World War II is the Polish contingent. Also in 2008, the Polish ambassador sent an official protest to the Press Complaints Commission about the Times. On the 26th of July 2008, Giles Corrin published a comment piece with the ethnic slur Pole accused to describe Polish immigrants. He accused Poland of complicity in the six million Jewish deaths of the Holocaust, prompting not only an official letter of complaint to the Times, but also an early day motion in the UK Parliament, followed by an editorial in The Economist. The ambassador, Tuge Arasinska, explained that the article was unsupported by any basic historic or geographic knowledge, and that the issue of Polish-Jewish relations has been unfairly and deeply falsified by Corrin's aggressive remarks and contempt. Corrin reacted by telling the Jewish Chronicle, fuck the Poles. The case has been referred to the European Court of Human Rights. However, the case was unsuccessful as Poles are not classified as an ethnic minority. The editor of the Jewish Chronicle, Stephen Pollard, commented on the 6th of August 2009, there are few things more despicable than anti-Semitism, but here's one of them, using a false charge of anti-Semitism for political gain. On 6 October 2009, Stephen Fry was interviewed by Jon Snow on Channel 4 News as a signatory of a letter to then-Conservative Party leader David Cameron expressing concern about the party's relationship with the right-wing Polish Law and Justice Party in the European Parliament. During the interview, Fry stated, There has been a history, let's face it, in Poland of a right-wing Catholicism which has been deeply disturbing for those of us who know a little history, and remember which side of the border Auschwitz was on. The remark prompted a complaint from the Polish Embassy in London, as well as an editorial in The Economist and criticism from British Jewish historian David Cesarani. Fry has since posted an apology on his personal weblog, in which he stated, It was a rubbishy, cheap and offensive remark that I have been regretting ever since. I take this opportunity to apologize now. On the 30th of October 2009, the chief rabbi of Poland, Michael Shudrick, complained about this new British political role playing on a false and painful stereotype that all Poles are anti-Semitic, whereas the truth was that the problem was around the same there as elsewhere in Europe. In January 2014, a Polish man, whose helmet was emblazoned with the flag of Poland, claimed he was attacked by a group of 15 men outside a pub in Dagenham, London. Photos were taken of him and his motorbike. The victim blamed xenophobic speeches of the Conservative Prime Minister David Cameron. During the same month in Belfast there were seven attacks on Polish houses within 10 days, in which stones and bricks were thrown at the windows. In November 2014, Lidl supermarkets were exposed by the BBC for threatening staff with termination of employment for speaking Polish during work and at their tea breaks.
Following the British referendum of EU membership, there were more cases of polonophobic attacks including anti-Polish leaflets distributed in Huntingdon and graffiti against the Polish Cultural Center in Hammersmith. The death of a Polish man in Hollow was initially reported as being a possible Brexit-related hate crime, but this was discounted at the subsequent trial. In a 2018 interview, Anna Azari, the Israeli ambassador to Poland, said that anti-Polonism occurs not only in Israel, but also in Jewish circles outside Israel. She also said that her embassy was working with non-governmental organizations in Poland to develop cooperation between companies and people. On the 14th of November 2007, Fox aired an episode of Back to You called Some Things Up There, which contained a controversial anti-Polish slur. The slur involved Marsh trying to convince the show's lone Polish-American character, Gary, to go bowling after work by saying, Come on, it's in your blood, like Kielbasa and collaborating with the Nazis. Fox later apologized on the 20th of November 2007. They vowed never to broadcast the line of dialogue again in repeats and or syndicated broadcasts. Fox stated that, the line was delivered by a character known for being ignorant, clueless, and for saying outlandish things. Allowing the line to remain in the show, however, demonstrated poor judgment, and we apologize to anyone who was offended. In August 2005, a series of alleged organized attacks against Polish diplomats took place in Moscow, which prompted the then Polish president Aleksander Kwasniewski to call on the Russian government to stop them. An employee with the Polish embassy in Moscow was hospitalized in serious condition after being assaulted in broad daylight near the embassy by unidentified men. Three days later, another Polish diplomat was beaten up near the embassy. The following day the Moscow correspondent for the Polish daily Rex Pospolita was attacked and beaten up by a group of Russians. It is widely believed that the attacks were organized as revenge for the mugging of four Russian youth in a public park in Warsaw by a group of skinheads, several days earlier. The former Solidarity leader and Polish president Lech Walesa criticized the Lithuanian government over discrimination against the Polish minority, which included the enforced Lithuanization of Polish surnames and the removal of bilingual Polish language street signs in municipalities predominantly inhabited by the Polish-speaking population. In 2011, Walesa rejected Lithuania's order of Vitotis the Great. Polish jokes belong to a category of conditional jokes meaning that their understanding requires knowledge of what a Polish joke is. Conditional jokes depend on the audience's effective preference, on their likes and dislikes. Though these jokes might be understood by many, their success depends entirely on the negative disposition of the listener. Presumably the first Polish jokes by German displaced persons fleeing war-torn Europe were brought to the United States in the late 1940s. These jokes were fueled by ethnic slurs disseminated by German National Socialist propaganda, which attempted to justify the Nazis' murdering of Poles by presenting them as dreck dirty, stupid and inferior. But it is also possible that some early American Polak jokes from Germany were originally told before World War II in disputed border regions such as Silesia. There is debate as to whether the early Polish jokes brought to states such as Wisconsin by German immigrants relate directly to the wave of American jokes of the early 1960s. A provocative critique of previous scholarship on the subject has been made by British writer Christy Davis in The Mirth of Nations, which suggests that Polish jokes did not originate in Nazi Germany but much earlier, as an outgrowth of regional jokes rooted in social class differences reaching back to the 19th century. According to Davis, American versions of Polish jokes are an unrelated purely American phenomenon and do not express the historical old world hatreds of the Germans for the Poles. However, Hollywood in the 1960s and 1970s imported the subhuman intelligence jokes about Poles from old Nazi propaganda. For decades, Polish Americans have been the subject of derogatory jokes originating in anti-immigrant stereotypes that had developed in the U.S before the 1920s. During the partitions of Poland, Polish immigrants came to the United States in considerable numbers, fleeing mass persecution at home. They were taking the only jobs available to them, usually requiring physical labor. The same ethnic and job-related stereotypes persisted even as Polish Americans joined the middle class in the mid-20th century. The constant derision, often publicly disseminated through the mass media, caused serious identity crises, 
feeling of inadequacy and low self-esteem for many Polish Americans. In spite of the plight of Polish people under Cold War communism, negative stereotypes about Polish Americans endured. Since the late 1960s, Polish American organizations have made continuous effort to challenge the negative stereotyping of the Polish people once prevalent in American media. The Polish American Guardian Society has argued that NBC TV used the tremendous power of TV to introduce and push subhuman intelligence jokes about Poles using the repetitive big lie technique to degrade Poles. The play called Polish Joke by David Ives has resulted in a number of complaints by the Polonia in the US. The Polish jokes heard in the 1970s were particularly offensive, so much so that the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs approached the US State Department about that however unsuccessfully. The syndrome receded only after Cardinal Karl Wojtyla was elected Pope, and Polish jokes became passé. Gradually, Americans have developed a more positive image of their Polish neighbors in the following decades. In 2014, a German speaker claimed during the European Aquatics Championships, that the Polish team would be coming back home in our cars. The term anti-Polonism is said to have been used for campaign purposes by political parties such as the now-defunct League of Polish Families or the equally defunct Self-Defense of the Republic of Poland as well as by Polish organizations such as Association Against Anti-Polonism led by Leszek Bubel, leader of the Polish National Party and a former presidential candidate. Bubel was taken to court by a group of ten Polish intellectuals who filed a lawsuit against him for violating the public good. Among the signatories were former Foreign Minister Władysław Bartoszewski and filmmaker Kazimierz Rejhatz. According to writer Joanna Miklik, the term is used in Poland also as an argument against the self-critical intellectuals who discuss Polish-Jewish relations, accusing them of anti-Polish positions and interests. For example, historian Jean T. Gross has been accused of being anti-Polish when he wrote about crimes such as the Jedwabne pogrom. In her view, the charge is not limited to arguments that can objectively be classified as anti-Polish, such as equating the Poles with the Nazis, but rather applied to any critical inquiry into the collective past. Moreover, anti-Polonism is equated with anti-Semitism. Adam McNick wrote for the New York Times that almost all Poles react very sharply when confronted with the charge that Poles get their anti-Semitism with their mother's milk. Such verbal attacks, according to McNick are interpreted by anti-Semites as proof of the international anti-Polish Jewish conspiracy. For the 1994 anniversary of the Warsaw Uprising, a Polish Gazeta Y Borzar journalist, Michał Sitchi, wrote a review of a collection of 1943 memoirs entitled Zygesta Mordeka. By Kalel Perekudnik, a Jewish ghetto policeman from Ottawa and member of the Krubri II Battalion, alleging that about 40 Jews were killed by a group of Polish insurgents during the 1944 uprising. Unlike the book, the actual review by Sitchi elicited a fury of protests, while selected fragments of his article were confirmed by three Polish historians. Professor Tomasz Strzymbos accused Sitchi of practicing a distinct type of racism, and charged Gazeta Y Borzar editor Adam Miknik with cultivating a species of tolerance that is absolutely intolerant of anti-Semitism yet regards anti-Polonism and anti-Goeism as something altogether natural. Miknik responded to the controversy, praising the heroism of the act by asking, is it an attack on Polish people when the past is being explored to seek the truth? Sitchi later apologized for the tone of his article, but not for the erroneous facts. The notion of anti-Polonism has been used in some instances as a justification for Polish anti-Semitism. Cardinal Józef Glemp in his controversial and widely criticized speech delivered on 26 August 1989 argued that the outbursts of anti-Semitism are a legitimate form of national self-defense against Jewish anti-Polonism. He asked Jews who have great power over the mass media in many countries to rein in their anti-Polonism because if there won't be anti-Polonism, there won't be such anti-Semitism among us. Similar concerns, but with less display, were echoed in Rethinking Poles and Jews by Robert Cherry and Anna Maria Orla Bukowska who noted that anti-Polonism and anti-Semitism remain grotesquely twinned into our own time. We cannot combat the one without combating the other. In 2001, Ph.D. Andrzej Leszek Szczesniak published Judeo Polonia, the Jewish state in Poland, explaining the origins of pre-war Jewish saying our tenements 
your streets. In 2002, Stanislaw Wysocki published anti polonism Zydo Polskich naming incidents in Polish Jewish relations, criticized by Professor Josie Tomaszewski as selective, unrepresentative, and ignorant. Notes Bibliography Further reading Bibliography Further reading Bibliography Further reading Bibliography Further reading Bibliography Further reading